Programming Fundamentals was the very first class of my software engineering degree, and today I thought I'd review everything that I've learned. It's often quite hard to know what a subject will be like before taking it, so this is actually the start of a new series where I break down each university course as I do it, and review what I learned week by week. So welcome everyone, my name is Marcel and I am a software engineering student from Australia. I talk about the software engineering industry and everything I learned along the way. So if you enjoy this video or think I'm providing any value, I would much appreciate a like on the video and a subscribe to the channel. Like I mentioned, Programming Fundamentals is the first class of my software engineering degree. So if you're taking computer science or software engineering at a different uni, it might be called Introduction to Programming or Programming 101, but regardless, it should be the same content or very similar. Now, anyways, let's get into the video. The first week of the subject starts out with the basics of programming. The professor asks the students a simple question. What is programming? After the class debates it for a while and provides overly complicated answers, the professor breaks it down to say that programming is simply the art of telling a computer what to do. We can tell a computer what to do through tools called programming languages. Now, programming languages allow humans to provide instructions, often in a human readable format, that then get translated into binary code for a computer to understand. Now, the reason that defining programming like this is so important is because when you get into the field, there are so many programming languages, methodologies, and frameworks that kind of get thrown at you and it can seem like an endless void. And the professor emphasizes that while these tools change over time, they all boil down to the same process of translating to binary and telling a computer what to do. After many years of progress in this industry, programming can now build websites, web apps, desktop apps, robots, AI, and so much more. So after week one introduces us to programming in a more theoretical lens, week two gets a bit more practical as we work with our first programming language. So when I took the course, the professor taught us in Java, but the language that you start out with doesn't really matter as the principles we learn apply across many programming languages. We're first introduced to an IDE, which is an integrated development environment. All this is, is an application where we can write, run and test our code all in one place. So when we did Java, we used NetBeans, but you might be used to Visual Studio or Atom, IntelliJ or something like that. After setting up our IDE, we're shown some basic statements of the language and shown how we can make simple programs such as the Hello World program. So next up, we learn about variables and we're taught that variables are simply a way that we can store information about a program. We're also shown how variables can be referenced and manipulated over time. As an example, we took some pre-made messages that we all made and stored them in variables and we're shown how to print them out later in the program. To show the manipulation side, we created some number variables and did some basic maths. Now you'll notice with these two variables that one has quotation marks and one doesn't, they're just numbers. And so this brought us to the next topic of week two, which is data types. We're shown that data types are simply a way of classifying variables to indicate what type of data might be inside. So some basic data types here could be integer, string, float, boolean, etc. So as a quick disclaimer, a string in programming is just essentially a sequence of characters. So we use these for messages and words and things like that. So when we look back at our example, we can see that the pre-made messages we made would be strings noted by the quotation marks and the number variables would be integers in this case. Now in week three, we're introduced to conditional statements. As they sound, conditional statements are essentially instructions that only get performed if a condition is true. In programming, we often use the structure of if a certain condition perform a set of actions. We then expand on this by looking at if else statements. If a certain condition is true, perform this action. Otherwise, else perform this action. These can be expanded out with else ifs, which provide extra options if the first condition isn't true, and you can go from there. The reason that conditional statements are so powerful and are used all the time is because they allow us to control the flow of our program and create different branches of user interaction with our programs. Now, moving into week four, we're introduced to arrays. So we're taught that arrays are simply a data structure that hold a sequence of values. If you're new to data structures and arrays, you can think of them as just a list of values of whatever data. Arrays help us avoid having a ton of different variables and also lets us work on them in a safe and manageable way. One cool thing about arrays is that they're indexable, which means that you can look up a value using the certain position in the array. I should also mention as well, in the majority of languages, arrays only hold one data type. 
Arrays work a little differently depending on the language. So I would look up how arrays work in the language that you start out with, just to make sure you don't make any mistakes. So with what we've learned so far, if we wanted to repeat a task multiple times, we would just have to write it out manually as many times as we wanted to do it. As you can imagine, if we wanted to do something a hundred times, this would get very laborious and very messy in our code. So week five introduces us to loops, starting out with a for loop and a while loop. We can use these loops to repeat an action repeatedly, depending on a certain condition or the number of times you want to do it. Starting out with for and while loops, we're taught how to manipulate variables and use statements in a set block, and we can do it as many times as we want. So up first, we have a while loop, and a while loop essentially says, while a certain condition is true, perform these actions. On the other hand, we have the for loop, and the for loop is a bit more complicated in how we write it out, but it's essentially saying that, for a given amount of times, repeat this action. Both of these loops here have the same outcome and it can be often hard to see or know the differences between them and when to use each one, especially when you first start out. So the for loop is used when we have an understanding of how long the loop should run for. For example, if you only want it to run like 10 times or to a certain length of an array or something like that. On the other hand, we have the while loop, like I mentioned, is conditional based. We only want it to run while that condition is true. We don't care exactly how many times it runs as long as it follows that condition. So after learning about loops, week six introduces us to functions. Functions are how programmers reuse parts of code without rewriting them multiple times. We're taught that functions can take in inputs known as parameters and also return an output. Programmers often use functions to break down big problems into smaller steps. For example, if we're making a program to make a cup of coffee, there's a lot of steps in that process and it would be quite a lot of code to write out in one go. Using functions, we can break down the big problem step by step while also providing a bit more clarity to any other developers who are reading our code. To build a function, we have to define it first. Depending on the language, defining a function can be really easy or quite complex. Regardless, the key details you need for almost any programming language is the function name and the parameters that you're passing into it. You can think of parameters as values that you're passing to the function for it to use while it does its job. Once our function is now defined, we can call it as much as we want anywhere in our program. So just by using functions, we can clean up our code and improve it a ton from big sprawling mess to neat and reusable functions. Now moving on, week seven introduces us to searching and sorting algorithms. So when I took this class, I remember week seven and sorting and searching to be the turning point where a lot of us who were just chilling and having a good time had to really pay attention because it moved quite fast. And also I was confused why we were learning about sorting and searching algorithms. To me at the time when I was first learning, it seemed something a bit unrelevant to what we were learning previously and I couldn't see how it was useful. But now as I look back, I recognize that we learned them for a variety of reasons. Firstly, being able to search and sort data effectively is one of the most common use cases of programming and is extremely relevant. And secondly, they introduce us to some more mature aspects of programming, such as planning out our algorithms, computational complexity, and some new data structures along the way. So as this was just a fundamentals class, we learned two of each algorithm. For searching, we're taught about linear search and binary search. Linear search is quite simple, it's kind of how humans search through data. Essentially you start at the front of a data set, so it could be an array of data for example, and you just start from the beginning and loop through each value until you find what you're looking for. Obviously you can kind of see that this is quite slow, so we're then taught about binary search. And binary search is a bit more complicated, but it's much much faster. So binary search works on an ordered data set, so it has to go from smallest to largest. So you have your target value that you're looking for, perhaps you're looking for the number 20 in a data set. You would pick a random point and see what the value is. So if I picked 40 out of 100, I'd know, okay, 40 is less than, it's more, <laughs> it's more than 20. So we're going to only look left in this data set from now on because it's in an ordered index. So just say we pick another value and it turns out to be 10. We're like, okay, cool, 20 is more than 10. So we're going to head right from now on. So you keep decreasing the border size until you find what you're looking for. And as you can see, that process is much faster. It might only take you, I don't know, five or 10 attempts rather than linear search where you could take up to 100. 
So while we're not actually introduced to this topic in the class, this is kind of hinting towards computational complexity or how much effort is required by an algorithm depending on the size of a data set. So as you can tell, linear search is much more computationally heavy or complex and take more time and power than binary search because there's so many less iterations in binary search than there is in linear search. Now moving on to sorting algorithms, we're also shown two, the bubble sort and the selection sort. So first bubble sort involves looking at a data set and comparing two values at a time moving through a data set. As you move through the data set, you look at the two values and if they're not in order, you just swap them so they're in order. And so as you go through, you're going to make some swaps along the way and then you restart from the very beginning. So you go, all right, check the next two, next two, oh, these need to swap, swap them around, check the next two, etc. And you do that, you repeat it as many number of times as it needs until you go through the whole data set and you don't need to do any more swaps then you know that it's in perfect order. Next, we have our selection sort. So selection sort is a bit more sophisticated. It's about keeping the start of an array or data set to always be ordered. So at the very beginning, you're going to have nothing in there. What you're going to do is you're going to look through your data set and find the smallest value. You're then going to take that value and push it into the front of the data set and repeat that times as many times as you need to make the unordered set um, a length of zero. So there's nothing left in there and now you have your completely ordered, ordered section. This will always work because the smallest value in the unordered part of whatever you're looking at, the data set, will always be the largest value in the ordered section. So you can just push it to the front and you'll know it'll always be safe. And that wraps up week seven, so I hope your brain isn't too melted from that. We're gonna go into the next very easy, simple, lovely topic of object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming is a topic that was a bit big, so they split it up into week eight and week nine. So in these two weeks, we learn that object-oriented programming is a style of programming where we bundle functions and data together into these single entities known as objects. We then use these objects and their interactions to build out our programs and solve problems. Oftentimes, objects represent real-world entities, so we model the functions and data that objects have to what occurs in the real world. We use what are known as classes in object-oriented programming to act as a template for these objects. So this is very confusing. I'll break it down with a quick example. Imagine we're working at a farm program kind of thing. We're making a farm game. We have a cow. So cows need to be able to do a certain thing. They need to eat, they need to move, and they need to walk around. Those are the functions that the cow would have. The data that it might have, it might have a name, just say Betsy, right? Betsy the cow. You then have, you know, its lifespan. I don't know. You know, so <laughs> you just have data about the cow, what color it is, what type of milk it makes. I don't know. You know, I don't know if they make different types of milk, but you know, the oat milk cow, just say. I'm being stupid now. <laughs> we have our cow object, right? And that's great. We can build out our cow object. But if we want a way of making multiple cows, we don't want to write it out each time. So we're going to have a cow class where we can just call it and say, make more cows for us, give us another cow. And by doing so, we don't have to write out the exact data that it's going to have and the exact functions it needs each time because it's already predefined by the class. And so once we do that, we can now have one or infinite amount of cows. So that is essentially the introduction to object-oriented programming in terms of how objects and classes work. I should mention though, object-oriented programming relies on four main principles, encapsulation, inheritance, abstraction, and polymorphism. So I'm not gonna talk about each principle in depth today because they could have their own video each, but just know that by following these principles, they kind of create the foundations for robust, reusable, and maintainable software. So following the basics of object-oriented programming, week 10 introduces us to a bit more of a complex topic of interfaces. Now, if classes are templates for objects, we can think of interfaces as special templates for classes. So when a class implements a interface, the interface defines what the class must be able to do but doesn't say exactly how it must be done. So in reality, this allows us to have different adaptations of certain interfaces and allows us to be really flexible in how we build and manage our programs. So back to the cow example, I don't know why I'm using cows, but it just, it works. We have the cow class, which makes our infinite cow objects. 
An interface could be an animal interface. As a programmer, we've noticed that animals, no matter what it is, cow, chicken, sheep, need to be able to do similar functions. They all need to be able to walk around and make a noise. For each animal class we make, we can say it implements the animal interface and already it's told and defined what it must be able to do to be able to be classified as an animal. But as the interface doesn't specifically tell what the function must be able to do, just that it has the function, we can customize these functions depending on the animal. If you have a cow, right, if you have a cow animal, that make noise function might result in a moo, but the chicken might be a, a bock, you know, or something like that. It might be it's different implementation of the function, but it's the same make noise function. As you can see, that's a kind of stupid example, but it gives an idea of why interfaces are important and how they can be used to be flexible with our classes and objects. So we use interfaces to kind of dictate our classes and objects and ensure they conform to a set of expectations and protocols. So this improves the readability and maintainability of our code while also abiding by the rules of object-oriented programming that I mentioned before. Now moving on to the last week of week 11, we learned about generics. So generics allow us to define classes to work with multiple data types rather than just one. As an example, if we had a list class and that list originally only could hold integers, for example, we can use generics to make it a generic class and be able to take a list of any data type. So this means this list can hold strings, integers, booleans, whatever it may be, but it's the same list class. So this allows us to not have to write out a bunch of different classes that do the same thing just for different data types. This results in much more flexible and reusable code. So that was everything we learned in programming fundamentals in my software engineering degree. I hope that gave you insight into what this class will be like or similar classes. If you liked this video, I really believe you'll like my recent video, which is five ways to get a paid internship as a software engineer. Like I mentioned earlier, this is the start of a series where I break down each of the classes as I go along, and I'll also be giving away my notes for each class. So if you enjoyed the series, leave a comment below, I'll really appreciate that. But thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye everyone.